Paul, thanks for letting us into your space. You're very welcome. Tell us all about this fantastic building, how it came together. Um, well, we've been looking, we were living in London and we were looking for a place to um, turn into a recording studio basically, but we couldn't afford anything. So um, I was uh, staying with some friends in, in Swindon here and I was just out walking my dog along the canal at the back and I found, found this old building. So on the off chance, I, I tried to find out who owned it, banged on his door and uh, asked him if he wanted to sell it. And he did, but he wanted too much money. So we kept going back every couple of months to see uh, if he got lower and eventually we got it at the right price. Right. It was a bit of a wreck, but we you know, got all my road crew and all my friends and we went at it, basically. And this is the In Heaven studio? It right? is, yeah. Yeah, the control room at the back there. That's right, and um, this is the main live area, but we got feeds to all the uh, other rooms so we can record wherever we want, basically. Right, and that fantastic mural up on the back there, you put That's that right. together yourself? Yeah, you know? I made that in my spare time. Right. So when I wasn't uh, in the band and building, yeah. Get a lot of spare time in this band, so. And you're telling us this story about when you moved into the place, you were digging it up and uh, you had a, a grim discovery. Oh uh, yeah, well not really grim, I'm kind of <laughs> lucky I think. Uh, we, um, it was an old uh, tin sc Sunday school at the back and uh, we needed a space to um, make a garden. So we were knocking it down and the dogs were sort of going crazy. So we thought they'd found a rat or something under the floor. And um, when we took the floorboards up, we found um, a hacksawed up skeleton scattered all over the place. So uh, we called the police and they said that oh, it's probably an animal. And when they came, you know, they said, no, it's not an animal, it's a body, took it away. Uh, did forensics on it, said no one's made the hacksaw blade for a hundred years and you can have it back, so they gave it back to us. Right. So it's basically that. Right. You've just flown in from Poland. I have. I drove from Poland, actually. Right. 25 hours. 25 hours. Yeah. And how are the gigs there? Fantastic, yeah, brilliant. Um, Psychobilly seems to be on a big up now at the moment, which is good. Um, we've, we've only been to Poland once before when it was uh, still communist. By this time it was totally mental, yeah, 2,000 people right. screaming, basically. Right. And before that you were in, last summer you were in Japan, weren't you? Uh, yeah, last summer we were in Japan. Uh, same thing there, they've always been pretty good in Japan anyway, they're quite wacky, so right. we've always had, always had a big following. And Are Psychobilly fans like the same? From country to country, or are records in Japan different from? Uh... Um, yeah, very slightly. I mean, they're a bit more polite in Japan, but um, yeah, they just go just as crazy. Right. So. And you got a live album out from that, which is Hell in the Pacific. I have, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and that, you mentioned there there were some backline problems. Is, is this a thing when you're touring sometimes that you. It oh. is. I mean, we don't like to make a fuss. We're pretty. pretty um, we've done 4,000 shows now, so we just <laughs> take the guitars and a bass drum pedal and. Hope for the best, really. Right. Don't like to make a fuss. It's only a three-piece, and at this point, it's been a prima donna of ours. So. Right. And how did this lineup come together with Mark and Wolfgang? Uh, well, Wolfgang, the drummer, was originally my um, drum roadie. <laughs> and it's a sort of Cinderella thing. He sort of worked his way up to drummer as we um, got rid of drummers. Basically, we, I mean, we've had a few, a few. I think we've had about nine drummers. Right. Um, some of them go mental. One of them got shot, and. Uh, some of them just leave because I'm a bit of a bugger to work with, but right. he's stuck with me for 20 years, so he got the job. And Mark? Um, Mark was actually in a band that was recording here, one of the, another psychobilly band, and um, I nicked him, basically. <laughs> um, I still get death threats off his singer, but it doesn't make any difference to me. Right, right. So going back now to your roots and how you got into psychobilly right. and, and your music, you know, when you were a young lad, what was the first single you ever bought, Paul? Um, the first single? Well, first of all, um, all the sort of music I ever heard was like 50s rock and roll from my dad and stuff like that, you know, or sort of Johnny Cash, that sort of stuff. I've never really been into anything else. Um, the first record I ever bought was probably The Shadows. Right. Something like that when I was about 12 or something like that. And Hank Marvin yeah. is a hero of yours. He is, well, yeah, he's a big influence on me. He's, a, he's really underestimated. Just, mm -hmm. He plays a, quite a simple style, but if you, um, he's a lot better guitarist than people give him credit for, really. And which other sort of guitarists were you listening to around that time? You know, the rockabillies that your dad was playing? Oh, uh, all people like Chuck Berry and um, uh, Link Ray, to a certain extent. Um, any of the people that played with Gene Vincent, uh, Cliff Gallup and uh, Johnny Burnett, them sort of people. 
And you, in the 60s, 60s stuff as well, yeah? You sort of into garage punk like electric uh, prune? Not too much. I, no. I, I'm sort of getting into it a bit now, really. I haven't right. had a lot of time to stop and listen, but I like stuff like. Um, I like okay, I like Motorhead, I like the Ramones, I like Beethoven, you know, so it depends what yeah. you listen to. Just can't stand too heavy dub or too um, sentimental country and western. Try to listen to everything, really. Right. And uh, you've done 17 or 18 albums since 1980. You're I think we're on our 32nd now. 32nd? Yeah. Oh, 17 on the yeah, website. It's, so, it's, yeah, so. I know, that's an old website, <laughs> it's getting updated. Yeah. Um, is it always a case where you're looking forward to the next album. Oh yeah. Do you is listen it, to your old stuff at all? I have to, to stop myself from rewrite, because it's such a basic formula, it's like killing people in three chords. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have to, I listen to it a lot to make sure that I don't rewrite myself really. Right. And also to make sure that, I mean, I do like it to progress, but if you go too outside the formula, then people don't like it really, so. And just continuing still on the sort of the sound of the rockabilly guitar, mm -hmm. um, can you remember the first rockabilly single you bought or, or album, you know, just when you heard that twangy I sound? I can remember when I first heard the word rockabilly, yeah, when we, were, um, we were all telly boys in the, um, in the 70s and uh, somebody came and showed me, um, said, do you know what rockabilly is? I said, I've never heard of it. And they, they said, neither have we, but we found this album that sounds like rock and roll. And uh, I think we must have been the first people to hear the word right. when I was about 15. Right. Uh, we went along, it was a thing called uh, CBS Rockabillies and um, turned my life over really. Right. Because it wasn't so polished as sort of, you know, rock and roll. It was just raw, it sounded like anybody could do it, so. But before that you were Teddy Boy's Rock and Roll Revival in the 70s, yeah? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah just, that was the only cult to be in, you could either be a bonehead or a, a skinhead or a... London band Teddy called Boy. Fumble, something that they, they were sort of 70s. Yeah, sort yeah. of like that, yeah. 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 When did you start getting the vision for making your own band? What, what, when did you start playing? Um, well, we used to go to all these clubs and, and uh, see, see bands playing, but it, it was sort of all based on American culture, yeah? and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't get my head around high school or <laughs> um, Cadillacs, and things it didn't really have any relevance to me. But I loved the music, so uh, we used to say, oh, well, we could do this. And we used to say it every weekend, and then one day, uh, we must have been drunk, we must have just said, let's do it. And we went out and bought some instruments, and we had a gig about a month later. And how long and We couldn't you, really play, so... How long have you been playing guitar at that point? None, never. Right. Well, you know, like, fiddling about, but... Um, I started playing more or less at the same time. So that would have been about mid-70s, something like that, yeah? Yeah, about 70, yeah, 75, 76. Right. And then um, we did our first gig, which was really crap, and everybody chucked stuff at us, and we just... <laughs> but I made up Where my mind. Where was that? Was that South London? It was in a place called... The Black Bull in um, Lewisham, which is not a particularly safe area to be. Anyway, so... Right. But I made up my mind I wasn't going to work, so that's what I was going to do, so we just persevered. Right. And... Um, was that Raw Deal, the band, or...? Uh, it was started off as a band called The Southern Boys, because we came from South London. And then it changed into Raw Deal, for some right. reason. Um, and then it sort of evolved. As, as um, we got more aggressive with the fact that nobody liked us, it sort of turned into a more aggressive thing, yeah. Rather than trying to make people love us, we, we just tried to uh, say it didn't matter, yeah. Eventually it became the doctrine of the band, yeah. Right. Were the Stray Cats an influence at all? They weren't around at the time. Uh, they, I mean, the fact that they became um, um, popular was a really big, was one of those things, being at the right place at the right time yeah. for us. Yeah, Because it was just around that time, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it gave, gave us a big boost. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hadn't really heard of them, but suddenly Rockabilly became quite popular. Yeah. Right. And um, talking about the, on your website, it was, um, as I understand it, your the band was going to be a reaction against soft rockabilly. That's right, yeah, we were trying to make, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, rock, rockabilly was kind of like the punk of the 50s, like we were rock and roll, I mean, you sort of do up soft, overproduced rock and roll was like pop. Yeah. And rockabilly was, to me, seemed like the punk of the 50s, where they used, people used to dye their hair and, you know, it was oh. a lot harder and oh. a lot um, more spontaneous, really. Right. I so didn't really know much about punk, but I, I figure that's, that's a good equivalent. 
what did you think of the Cramps who were doing that sort of punk CBGBs? I really like, I really like, like the Cramps, you know. Um, um, I didn't think it was, I mean, people compare us, but I don't think it's the same thing, really. It's more like, a, I look upon it like that. Cramps is more of a heroin, not, not the drug, but the feel to it, and the meat is just more like an amphetamine sort of thing, yeah? Right. But um, we did a big tour with them, they were, they were fairly nice, as, as Americans. <laughs> Poison Ivy, you like the guitarist, yeah? Yeah, she was all right. I liked her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was American, yeah? But I did like it, yeah. It must have influenced me in some way, but it was... We were playing a long time before we saw right. them, so... Right, right. Um, when, did, when did you write your first song? <sighs> must have been about when we started. I can't remember, really. So you got guitars... You had a gig one month later, yeah, so... Yeah, it was about one month, six weeks later, and we were playing all what we thought were covers, but they were right. just, like, mess-ups of somebody else's song, you know, and then... Uh, I started writing roughly when it changed into the meteors, really, so... Right. To try and give it a bit of an individual right. feel to it, rather than be a revival type of band. And so the meteors started in 1980, that's, that's, More the, or less, yeah. that's the start point, and... At what point did you sense, you know, before that with Raw Deal, at what point did you sense that the audience was getting into you as opposed to sort of giving you... When they stopped chucking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just when, um, did, when, when they started, um, instead of standing around and staring, when they started coming up and saying, yeah, we really enjoyed that, and, you know, it's... Right. It's a different thing, they, they used to tell us. So. And the original band with Mark Lewis and Mark Robertson? Uh, Nigel Lewis and Mark Robertson, yeah. Sorry, sorry uh, Nigel Lewis, yeah. Um, that was together about two years. Did you see that as being a long-term thing when it came together, did you? Um, I was just still amazed that we were making money out of it, really, and uh, I thought it, when we started, I thought it would last a couple of weeks, and, you know, I was just so, amazed. So I never really got on with Mark Robertson, really, but um, Nigel was a friend of mine, and uh, I wasn't really interested in who was drumming, but we were having fun, so... Right. So two years was a long time for that band, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah two you, years you is were a well, long well time, pleased. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and the first bit of vinyl that you had out was a, a a compilation on Alligator, was it? Yeah, it was called Homegrown Rockabilly. Right. That was just sort of within a day of trans transition between Raw Deal and the Meteors. We were called Raw Deal when we recorded it, and by the time it was out, we were the Meteors. So. Right. I mean, they made us make it soft for that, basically. I, I was, it was a chance to get on a record, so. Um, but they weren't happy with the harshness of the sound, so they said, can you make it a bit softer? I mean, I, I don't really regret doing it, but... Which song was it that you did? Ah, uh, bloody hell. Crazy Loving It's called, or something right, like that. Right, right. Yeah. I'm not sad I did it, but I wish I'd uh, put my foot down a bit more, but... Right. And so in the early 80s now, talking about the meteors, mm. um, record company interest, was it in... Were you sort of... What was the business side of it like? Were you looking after it? that, or...? Uh, no, we had a manager, but... Like, like ours, he didn't know what he was doing either, so... But um, we had some uh, really big offers from Ireland and EMI and... Uh, um, CBS as well, I think, and... Um, they were throwing a lot of money at us, but... They wanted another... Stray Cats, Pole Cats type thing, and uh, we did, I didn't really want to do that. Which right. is why... Everybody started arguing, basically. And... Um, you know... That's, I think that's probably what made the other two guys. So, so, so the sort of Polecats, um, King Kurt, Batmobile thing, you saw yourself quite different from uh, that. I mean, King Kurt and Batmobile weren't even there then, so... Right. It was, a pole, it was just like... Um, yeah, I just didn't want to be pink-suited, basically. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, the money was never that important. I just wanted to keep on doing what we, we were doing, but it was a lot of money, so I suppose it pissed right. the other two off. And your, your first EP was Meteor Madness. That's you, right, yeah. you still play Maniac, Rockers from Hell. Yeah, don't I still you, do that, yeah. On your last and we try to stop, but people don't let us. So. Um, yeah, we, uh, I can't remember the guy's name. It was a, a film producer came and made a, wanted to make, because um, we were the thing at the moment, wanted to make a film uh, for the cinema as a short film. And um, that was called Meteor Madness. It went on with a, with a, two-tone film called Dance Crazy that was on right. all the cinemas um, and we just took four songs off of that. Right, right. I'm still knocking around somewhere as well, so... And then tell us how your debut album in heaven, after which the studio is called, 
how did that come together? Um, well, uh, that, uh, the guy from Ireland came along and um, to a gig once and said, I really like your record. Um, do you want to do something for Ireland? Um, I said, yeah, sh you know, we said, yeah, sure, why not? But we weren't really taking any notice of what was happening to us at the time, so the chance of uh, somebody wanting to make a, a whole album uh, seemed to be the thing, so he put us in the studio. Um, he didn't try to change anything about it, so we were quite happy happy to do that. And those were the songs that you've been gigging for yeah, the past year? Yeah, that, that so was a complete set there then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we weren't really headlining a lot of things, so a half an hour, 40 minute set was enough, so. Right. Um, but unfortunately, he then left Ireland, and um, the same old trouble of everybody wanting to make it into something it wasn't, so we managed to get out of that right. by just going into the office and making a big fuss. So they let us go. And uh, Screaming Lord Such, that was another collaboration around that time. How'd, how'd yeah, that... He, he, was, um, he's, he was a good bloke anyway, but he was uh, on the circuit at the same time, and uh, basically the the uh, EP that came out was just his EP on one side and our EP on the other. Right. And um, I saw one eBay, go on an eBay, eBay the other day for 600 quid, so. Wow. It's, it's quite rare, that man. Did you have a gig with him or? Oh yeah, a couple of times, yeah. Yeah. And was he still into his coming on stage in a coffin bit? <laughs> yeah, he was, yeah. He, he, he was just like he was on stage, yeah, he's, a, he's a bit mental. <laughs> but which I find quite nice. I hope, hopefully I can be that mental when I'm his age. Right, and, and in terms of theatricality, did you sort of pick up any tips from him around that time, you know, about stage shows and stuff? Um, not really from him, but by watching, you know, just seeing, seeing that there is a lot more to it than just standing in the corner looking at your feet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did, just by watching him. He never came up and, yeah, you know, he wasn't a bullshit bloke, no, he was quite a nice bloke, yeah. Right, right. And then there was a, a one-off name change to Clapham South Escalators. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. That's not what it would be. Um, Nigel and Mark were really psychedelic influenced, you know, like 60s. Uh, um, it, it never really interested me, but it didn't really bother me either. But um, um, we made a couple of tracks, like uh, outtakes or whatever they were, and um, then they got together and released it. I don't really know what right. happened there. I'm not really bothered about it. So it was those guys who did it, really? Yeah, yeah I'm on it, but... <laughs> By proxy. Right. And how did you choose Johnny Remember Me as a, you know, just talking about the cover yeah. versions that you've yeah. done, you've done, you know, Electric Prunes. Yeah, we do all kinds. Um, I, I try to look at, um, rather than just pick um, a rockabilly one and make a meters version, I look for songs, uh, songs that I'm singing basically, or something I like, and try to make that, do my own version of that, sort of boots made for walking or. Yeah. You know. Johnny Thunders did that as well, didn't he? Did he? Yeah, he oh, did. Right. It, it was the, the, that kind of, if you like the song, whatever style it's yeah, in. Yeah, um, like, oh, we did uh, Somebody Put Something In My Drink by the Ramones. Right. Because I, li I like the song, rather than just pick blue suede shoes and do a faster version. What's the, what's the point of that? And try, to, try to stretch it out. And Johnny Remember Me, that, that got That's into... That's just a bloody good song, I thought. And yeah. uh, it wasn't meant to be a single. It was uh, just an album track, but... But it did get into the top yeah, 100. Yeah, because it was softer than the one I wanted to choose. I mean, you know, like more palatable, so. Mm -hmm. I didn't choose it, the record company chose it. Right, and it um, got into the top 100, yeah? Yeah, it did, and the album got into into the top 10, I think, for about a minute. Wrecking Crew, yeah. 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 Did you like that business side of it? Or was no, that not something? Really. No. I don't, I understand now that it's necessary, you know what I mean? But uh, when you're a kid, you don't really care, do you? you just want to kick things and play. Right, <laughs> right. But um, I learned quick anyway. Yeah. And just some about some of the uh, the myths and legends surrounding the, the meteors. Um, Planet Zorch, can you take us through that? Um, that's just the sort of place we go when we're all stoned. Right. In our head, yeah. Right. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Um, and then it just became everybody else's imagination in the world expanded it into something I don't know what it is, but right. it's just what we used to call it when we used to get stoned, yeah. And the other or whatever, yeah. And <laughs> again on this website, yeah. um, your heroes are listed amongst others as Charles Manson yeah. and Mark Chapman. Yeah. Can you just take us through that? What, what's the heroic aspect of it there? I don't like the Beatles. <laughs> I, I know it's not, I mean, every time I say that to somebody, they go, but the truth <laughs> is I don't like the Beatles. They killed rock and roll for me, it made it easy to be pop. Um, so, good shot, basically. <laughs> Uh, I like all, 
I don't say it just to be um, to be the meters. Everything I got is I like horror. I like uh, to read about um, serial killers and things like that. So, I mean, I must have said that about twenty years ago, but right. The Charles Manson thing, that was, that was the thing. Yeah, I was just interested in the way that he, um, com it's a bit like controlling the band, really, isn't it? Do you, uh, nah. I gather the story there was he couldn't get a record deal, so he decided to do in some of the That's people. That's exactly what, yeah, similar to that, yeah. He yeah. wanted to, um, he was just a frustrated bloke who couldn't get, a, yeah. He tried to be um, a film producer as well, and they, they turned him down, so they to said to him, why don't you try rock and roll, it's easier. And uh, he couldn't even do that as well, so. I, th I think that twisted him into that, personally. Maybe not exactly, but... And that was a damn good question, mate. Made me think. <laughs> Other obsessions listed on your website. Mm -hmm. Horror, perversion, yeah. death. Yeah. If I can ask you one about the, the, the death aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, Jim Morrison had visions, you know, the bathroom is mentioned in the, the door songs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Eddie Cochran, I think, the night before he died, he sort of... Have you... Do you think a lot about death? Do you I have to, it's my job. <laughs> I don't think about killing myself a lot, no, but... Uh, um, I'm not obsessed with... I don't sit here all night thinking about it, but... Um, sometimes I do, yeah. But... Uh, not just, like, death per se, not just like that... Um, Yes, mainly horror and things like that. Like it's mm. more like um, uh, uh, I can't think of the word for it now. More like the um, culture of it, basically. I, li mm. I like I like things like that. Yeah. Mm. And and Devil Rides Out, Dennis Wheatley, was that? Yeah, I've got all them books. Yeah. I like, was I like he all... was he influential when you were younger? Uh, when I was younger, because that was that was the first sort of things I, I read, but. Um, Stuff like Alistair Crowley and um, stuff like and, uh, Anton LaVey, I still read all that. I don't actually fall for it all hook, line and sinker, but I look at it and um, try and find bits out of it, yeah. Mm. If we just return to the point you made about the Beatles, you know, mm. that they, they killed pop. No, right? no, killed rock and roll, basically. Right. When it's, <laughs> it's my theory, it's not, it doesn't have to be the truth. Uh, the Rolling Stones and um, the Beatles, um, the Beatles made it all right to make soft pop, lovey dovey bollocks, really, and uh, it's annoying to me. <laughs> so. And the Rolling Stones in the same breath, yeah? No, nah, the Rolling Stones kept it hard. And yeah. Mm. Whether or not I like the music, some of it I do, obviously, but it's all right. They made it all right to be um, anti pop, you know? Mm -hmm. Personally. It's like James I mean, Brown made disco, it gets on my nerves, huh? <laughs> And get get off of my cloud. You chose one of well. It's just like it's just one of the songs I was singing, and uh, we made a version of it. I changed all the lyrics, and uh, they took me to court. <laughs> but that's all right as well. So tell us more about that. Uh, well, they took me to court because I put just as a joke Jagger Richards Fennick on the record, <laughs> <laughs> just as a joke. And they took me to court, but the judge said they got enough money, so they can't have any more. So right. just take it off. I did that song. Right. But um, fair play to him. And any other Stone songs that you think of covering? Uh, we've done Paint It Black as well. And it's all over now. We've done a couple of times on some, on some records. Right, right. Um, I like the Rolling Stones anyway. I like the fact that they're still like the Rolling Stones. And your next project, current project, is uh, Fuck the Rest of Billies, yeah? Uh, the new album I'm working on at the moment was called that, though. That was, but now it's called uh, These Evil Things, it's called, because. Uh, it's less comical, yeah. And how do you sort of put together a new album? Is it the songwriting is all yours, or um, are you the, the main man? I write all the songs, basically, but I do take input. I take input from everybody in the road crew, you know, when we're out on the road, um, just things that happen to us, and um, somebody could say something, and while it's cooking about in your head for two weeks, just make a song out of it, yeah. Right. How much are you gigging at the moment for? A lot. We're on about 150 a year at the moment, so. Right. And a lot of that in Europe and... Yeah, well, it's sort of caught fire again everywhere now. And uh, we've done over, four, we've done our 4,000 show last week sometimes, so, wow. so we're still doing it, yeah. And when you're not doing it, how do you spend your time? Uh, 
sleeping and recording, basically, yeah. So you come back here and the yeah. ideas that you got on, on the road, you sort of... Yeah, I've got like, hundreds of bits of paper in my pocket and you know, stuff into a dictaphone and do my best to put it all together. So just on this, you know, this marvellous room here, you, you, the band is playing just in front there. Yeah, we set it up live because right. we, even when we record other bands, we, we specialise in, in bands sort of thing. So, I mean, we can screen it all off, but basically we set them up like live right? so they can get the... And the control room's at the back there. It is, yeah. Yeah, right. What, what, what bands have you recorded here? Oh, so bloody hell, we've done loads of Manic Street Preachers. Right. Motorhead. Uh, Iron Maiden. All sorts of things. But we do little bands as well, but... Right. Whatever we can get, as long as it's got guitars in it. Right. And look into... Done a lot of porn soundtrack as well, yeah. Hardcore <laughs> porn we do. We've done about six films, here. Yeah. All the 0898 chat line. No, we do anything, yeah. <laughs> wrecking is like all part of that scene that you yeah. you love. What is the most wrecked gig from memory? Just sort of not thinking too hard about it. But what, the where, most where, wreckage took took place. Yeah. Oh, it's not like wrecking the building. Yeah, but, but just, like, just going crazy. Um, well, I could I could pick any day this week or any day last week really. Um, some of them are a bit a bit. Uh, riotous than others, but they're all pretty hectic. It's right. full contact dancing, isn't it? It's, a, it's a cross between war and tap dancing or something like that. <laughs> Nobody ever really gets hurt. Anyway, we won't have that. Right. As, uh, as long as they um, pick each other up, that's the point. But in terms of, you just mentioned before we did the interview about oh, right. sort in of Pol blood. Yeah, recently, in Pol um, in the last gig in Poland was mad because uh, three times we had to stop the show while they put the barriers back together. I've never seen anybody tear steel barriers to bits before. It's pretty good. But um, everybody's, even the security and the bouncers, they were all in a good mood and nobody, you know, they just got on with it. It's fantastic. And just to finish off with, for the guitar people, you've got a collection there, just at the back there mm. of, I think about 20 guitars. Yeah. Is that, how, how much is that of your total collection? Is uh, it's about a third of it. I got 31 strats. I, I use mainly Fenders because they're um, solid really. Yeah? And, um, easy to use on the road and they're just like Fords, you just swap the parts about if you have to. I've got a couple of um, good old guitars that you can't take on the road, but I'm not, I'm not really that poncy about them. If it works, I'll use it, you know. Right. But, but you've got some, you know, Gibson 335s there Yeah, I've got, I've got, um, I've got a, a lot of, I've got three 1950s Stratocasters that are worth a lot of money. But, um, yeah, I'm a Fender man, basically, yeah, so. And you buy on the road, do you, or in America, or...? Um, no, I, I, I buy three at a time in a shop, so they all sound the same, and if I have to change, join the set, and whatever, and then uh, when they wear out, after a year and a half or so, I just hang them on my wall. Mm -hmm. Do you experiment a lot with sound? Yeah, I can't do it live, but I do in the studio, yeah, of course I do, yeah. Right, right. Live, we're, we're, we're pretty basic, yeah, so. Right. Well, Paul, thanks ever so much for You're welcome. bringing us to this space. Thanks. Come again. Thanks for your time. Cheers.